Welcome back, everybody, to the weekly Claymore Reviews. I'm reviewing Volume 8 today, and shit is getting a little bit dark, which I love and appreciate and was looking forward to because people were saying that, yeah, Claymore gets pretty dark as it goes on, and it is a shonen, but as you can see by the image that I chose as my background, shit's getting a little uh, shit's getting a little dark this time around, and I appreciate it. Also, with Volume 8, I'm officially one-third of the way through the series, and this is a manga that uh, a lot of people had recommended to me for a very long time, and I wanted to take my time reading it, do the volume volume reviews for you guys because it had been a very long time since I'd done a manga series review like volume by volume so I wanted to take my time with it do the volume reviews and everything but one third of the way through it already and I do have a whiteboard Claire for you today uh, this is Claire so she was going a little incognito today she uh, put her hair up in a little ponytail she did her hair a little bit differently going through town looking for Racky or Rocky whatever the fuck his name is uh, and so I, I drew Claire uh, looking very pretty that's the that's the prettiest I can do man I, I'm sorry but Whiteboard Claire, she's always going to be here for you. Whiteboard Claire will never leave you. Whiteboard Claire will never call you an idiot. Whiteboard Claire uh, will constantly hold your hand and reassure you that it's going to be okay. I mean, everybody needs a Whiteboard Claire in their life. Anyways, let's talk about Volume 8. There's a couple of really cool things that are happening here. Number one is we get the conclusion of the battle between uh, Claire and Ophelia, which uh, happened pretty quickly, actually. It happened within one chapter. I kind of wish it was in the tail end of Volume 7 because I was expecting a little bit more because I, I hadn't read Claymore for a week, right? So, like, going back into it, I was like, oh, yeah, we're in the middle of this, like, epic fight. Let's go. And uh, it happened, like, fairly quickly. So I was a little... It was nothing like with the series that's a disappointment with that. It was just that the gap in between I took uh, of reading Volume 7 and 8 going back to it. I wish I would have read it like straight through, but that's that's just a me thing. Anyways, the most interesting thing about the Ophelia battle was uh, besides the fact of her just like squirming through herself and then coming out the other end of her snake tail making a little like mermaid snake looking thing where she was like very kind of like sexually drawn and kind of interesting and I, I kind of enjoyed it and I might let her kill Kill me in real life if I were to encounter her. But besides that, um, the very interesting thing about it is that Ophelia was subtly kind of giving uh, Claire the motivation and clues to basically kill her off. And it was a little different than things I had seen before in Claymore because usually when somebody awakens fully to a Yoma, they kind of fully embrace that dark aspect of themselves. Whereas Ophelia seemed like she not necessarily was holding on ties to humanity because she was viewing it from like an external way where she was like thinking like uh, how her, I, I believe it was her brother that like uh, defended like her from the Yoma and allowed her a chance to run away. And she was like, that was really foolish of him. He probably shouldn't have done that. But she, she was looking at it from a different perspective now that she was transformed, but it was still this prevalent thing on her mind the entire time. So it was kind of like, uh, you know, even though she had transformed or fully awakened into a Yoma, this major uh, traumatic event that existed within her human human life was still the most thought about event even as her as a yoma she just kind of viewed it from a different lens so i thought that was interesting that that still was like the prime event of her life she was just like thinking about it differently and then also sort of like subtly giving uh claire the clues to the best way to defeat her it was sort of like like within that acceptance of her own death, she was recognizing Claire as in picking up the mantle and doing what she did before. So it's like, if you're going to continue doing that, she even says like upon her death, she's like, if you're going to continue doing this, I, I refuse to accept the possibility of you to fail. So it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, if you're going to do this, go all the way. Don't go halfway. Don't half-ass it. It's like, if this is what you're doing, then do it and like do it with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. You know, if that's your true goal, if that's your true objective in life, then do it 100%. I, and I don't think it was really meant to imply that Yomas have a sense of, like, quote-unquote, good inside them. I think it's just showing that once you awaken into a Yoma, you know, you still are that person you're just an awakened evil version of that person so like every yoma is going to be a little bit different because it's going to depend on who has fully awakened so you know it's not like just they're all immediately like hive mind the same they all still have their unique own individual personalities and that personality is based on who they were before and so ophelia being the person that she was you know she wanted to see something she wanted to see this followed through and so I think that's why she sort of gave that motivation to Claire. At least that's that's the way I'm viewing it. 
Anyways, after that, we get a couple more interesting things. One is we actually begin to see the council of uh, the head of this Claymore organization, or at least I'm calling it the council. I don't know what it's called, if it has a specific name or whatnot, but we do see a little bit of them. And dude, like they're obvious, they're Yomas, man. Are, are they not? Are they not Yomas? Do they not like look like these creepy motherfuckers that could transform into a monster at any second here? I mean, you know that they specifically send the Yomas out to the town to terrorize people. Then they send the Claymores to look like the heroes. They create the problem. Then they solve the problem. They get the reward money from that. But I guess I got to imagine that there's something more than just the financial reward going on here. There might be something more to it. There has to be. Like, if it's just financial, that just seems a little strange to me that you have all this, like, demonic power at your disposal but the thing that you're after is monetary unless they're using that monetary gain in order to create something even more like perhaps they need funding to create something like extra with the yomas i, ha I have no idea where that could possibly be going but like there's got to be another reason as to why they continue this thing maybe they're continuing like um, this perpetual fear in society like keeping people in this sort of like constant state of anxiety and panic knowing that there's always going to be yomas out there maybe it's keeping people you know dependent on them in some way maybe it's just keeping maybe it's just how they keep the yomas uh, around maybe that's just sort of the process maybe they just get rid of the weaker ones and contain and control the stronger ones with the claymores like i i don't really know but there's definitely just even looking at the characters like they're drawn in like the the typical sort of like antagonist shadowy you know figures and whatnot but like even like the uh one of the main dudes that we see I'm pretty sure they're not name dropped at this point, but you know, we see his face a little bit and he's so clearly like obviously a Yoma. So it's like, yeah, there's, there's more going on here than, uh, than they let their claymores know. And I can't wait until that group of claymores that Claire was with before that fought the original male Yoma kind of come back together and sort of infiltrate or, you know, take down this organization. So that's what I'm waiting to see. Then we get Claire uh, going back into a town, and she's looking for Raki, and uh, she's in, you know, a little bit of a disguise. She's suppressing her Yoma abilities. She's using a more masculine voice, and uh, I don't know, the way that she's got her hair, man, I, I, I just, bro, I was fawning a little bit, which is strange because, you know, I don't normally go for the whole ponytail vibe. Like, it's not my favorite look, but for some reason, she just kind of pulls it off. And I, I, I'm like, all about it. Like, come here. Like, I, I will grab that. And anyways, but she does stumble upon this group of claymores that are sent in to, of course, take down an awakened one. And she follows them. And then this is where we get this sort of barbaric scene right here, where we learn a couple of interesting things. And sort of why I wanted to stop at one volume for a review, because there's kind of a lot to talk about here. Uh, number one, okay, so... We don't actually get to see the battle between these claymores and what happened, but they're down here and they're being tortured to the point where they're trying to get them to awaken to their full form. And we have one of the top 10 here. She's number nine. Her name is Jean. I believe she's this one like right here. And they're trying to get her to awaken as well to sort of like uh, bring them over onto their team. And who are they? Well, there's this tiny little like young girl looking character, which I was very confused on what this was to begin with because she didn't look like a Yoma and she's obviously not a human and she has this awakened sort of like male yoma working for her so something very interesting and strange was going on here and through the process of this this male yoma finds or senses that claire is approaching they get into a battle claire just pretty much doesn't stand a chance even with her quick sword ability that she had learned doesn't really stand a chance against this thing until another character shows up and this character is Galatia, and she was the one that was sort of like spying on Claire in the previous volume, sort of keeping an eye on her, and that's why she's here. She's sort of been keeping an eye on Claire uh, by word of the organization and whatnot. So I wouldn't really trust her as far as, uh, you know, kind of understanding the inner workings of the organization and everything just yet. She might be. I'm not really sure. She might be, be you know, kind of playing both sides, like following orders and then also doing her own thing. We don't really know. I don't really know anything about her just yet other than she's like an extremely powerful fighter, which makes sense that she's the number three. She could sort of like predict uh, and sense where the her opponent is going to move, sort of evade them, and sort of get inside their head psychologically. In that she's evading them, making them think that they're going to uh, that they're not going to hit their target, which makes them even more anxious about throwing their punches and attacks and whatnot, which makes them. Uh, unable to hit even more. So it's basically like this psychological warfare that she's playing on him, which I thought was very interesting. And then we sort of get the lore breakdown as to what's happening with this young girl character. And I really liked what was happening here. It kind of reminded me a little bit of Yu Yu Hakusho with like the three kings, but, but basically what I'm getting out of this, what's going on is 
in the history of the Claymore organization, there have been three number ones out of like how they rank everybody, like their top fighters or whatever, three number ones that have reached the fully awakened state. Because usually they would be killed off before then because they would be aware that they're going to awaken, they would send another Claymore to kill that Claymore. But apparently in the history of the organization, three Claymores that were number one have transformed and fully awakened. One of them was a male because they did try males before they moved to females. So that's really scary to think there's a, a number one fully awakened male out there because we've seen how powerful just one male Yoma is. So the fact that we don't know like what ranking he was, but the fact that there even would be a number one ranked male Yoma, terrifying. Also even more terrifying when we learn that that male Yoma is like currently probably getting it on with Priscilla. That's the supposed kind of rumor that we're kind of learning towards the end of this volume or at least what it seems to be leading to. So we've got like a power couple working in the wings, doing something, creating some sort of terror and turmoil that uh, is not going to be good. So um, yeah, I can't wait to see what that like dysfunctional like power couple looks like. But then there all also are uh, two that were previous number one female Claymores that are also awakened, one of them being this young girl. So she apparently is able to hide her true form or transform back into a human state or be in like a little girl form or this is just her preferred way to look, whether it's like a, I don't know, like a bisky situation in Hunter x Hunter where she sort of like hides her, her true form, you know, wanting to look more young. Whatever the case may be, I don't know. But this is one of them and she's trying to gather as many awakened Yomas as she can because of this male Yoma that's sort of like now making moves, whether it's by the uh, the um, the manipulation or the uh, persistence of maybe Priscilla or whoever he's with, you know, I, I don't know if it's Priscilla 100%, but it seems like that's where this is going, and it, you know, it would make sense in a way. Uh, so he's he's kind of making moves and terrorizing things and is going to be a threat to the other Yomas. So she's basically trying to gather as many awakened ones as she can to kind of like combat him within this. And I really like this idea. I really like where this is going because this is sort of setting up like a three-way war between like these powerful demonic entities. And that's awesome. Reminds me of Yu Yu Hakusho, like I said, with the Three Kings, the final arc, you know what I'm saying? But like, I'm sure this is going to be a lot different, but that's where my mind goes because I, I love Yu Yu Hakusho show but uh yeah so i love that idea and i love that uh that the yomas themselves like i was saying in the beginning where we sort of learned about ophelia is that you know they're not they are evil in the sense that they're you know demonic creatures but like each one has a specific personality based on who they were before. So this little girl is doing things her way, what she thinks is the best way to kind of combat the situation that's going to be at hand, which is to, you know, capture these Claymores, torture them, force them to awaken, and then have them on her team, um, which is which is great. And she has the male Yoma, she has female Yoma. She's creating like a whole like army, basically. Uh, we don't know about the other female number one that may be out there. Uh, Priscilla was not another one. Priscilla was, what number was she? She was number she was number two so she's close but if she is currently with the number one male yoma that's like an like what are you gonna do also can yomas they can they appropriate can they like fucking have like a just morphic weird fucking child i don't know but anyways i'm super pumped to see where this goes and it makes sense that this is set up now as in if i am a third of the way through the series if you're treating a series like a, in a three-act structure you know so you have like the setup and then you have like the big action moments and you have the climax if, you, if you're setting things up then this is the perfect way to sort of end the first act and set up your kind of like prime antagonist and what's going on and so you have like multiple things happening at the same time you have the organization itself and now you have these sort of three yoma factions that are working you know either outside of that or there could still be some connection who the fuck knows um so it's a good thing to do for the storytelling to kind of build into the second portion of the series so super excited about it anyways guys if you've read volume eight of claymore if you've been following my reviews, let me know what you think about it all down below in the comments. Leave your thoughts, comments, concerns, theories, and everything else down below in the comments. Be very curious to hear your thoughts. I really did enjoy this volume, 
and I'm super stoked to continue the series and to see where it goes from here. So thanks as always for watching, guys. Really do appreciate it. Please like the video. Give it some engagement because uh, it will help in the algorithm and it will help these videos sort of be seen. Share it with more Claymore fans if you will. I'd really appreciate it. Um, also, you can check the links in the description below so you can find my Patreon and merch store if you want to support the channel on that little bit of an extra level. And there's also all my various social media links, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, where you can follow me. Other than that, guys, thanks for watching again. Hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you in the next review.